We are in Daf Samach Zayin Omed Aleph at the Gemara. Yesterday, we looked at a mission and we saw machlokas between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yehoshua. And the machlokas essentially is, when I totally botch an Ola Sa'of, a bird Ola, and I do everything that would normally be done to a Chatos instead. So, my Malika is only severing one simon instead of two. And I do the blood work ab- below the chut instead of above the chut. And my thinking is for the sake of a chattis instead of for the sake of an ola. So I've totally changed the, the, what's supposed to happen. So Rabbi Eliezer says, predictably, when you botch a carbon ola, so <clears throat> you can't consume the meat just because you, you decided you want it to be a chattis, the meat is not consumable, and therefore it's still subject to mi'ila because it was designated as an ola that was supposed to be completely for the mizbeach. But Rabbi Yehoshua says, and it's a little bit difficult to understand his logic, but the Gemara is going to speak it out more carefully today. He says that it's possible to transform this ola into a chatas, and as such, if you eat the meat of this chatas, you will not be in violation of mi'ila because the meat now becomes permissible for kohanim, just as if it was brought as from the beginning as a genuine chatas. So the Gemara now says Tanya. The we saw some of the logical uh, um, jousting back and forth between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua in the Mishnah, and now this debate continues in the Brisa. Amr lo Rabbi Eliezer lo Rabbi Yehoshua. He says, listen, you know, take another example. If you have an animal that's been designated as an asham, and you shechted on the right flank of the Mizbech like any other kadshe kadshim, but in your mind you're thinking that it should be for a shlamim. So would you think that it's not subject to mi'ila? Of course it's subject to mi'ila because you didn't do the carbon correctly. And since you didn't do the carbon correctly, this carbon is subject to me'ila. And therefore, don't be so surprised about an ola as well. That even though you change your intent and you say, I want it to be for a chatas, you can't take it out of its status of me'ila. It's subject to me'ila nonetheless. So, and therefore, so... Um, um, so, so that's really the argument. So Amr lo Rebbe Yehoshua lo. So it's retaining its original status, that's what we're saying. Rebbe Eliezer is arguing that it retains its original status as an Ola, yeah. so it's still subject to a Me'ila. So Amr lo Rebbe Yehoshua lo. He says, no, your analogy is flawed. Because imamarta ba'ashem shemshina es shemo lo shina es mekomo, tomar ba'ola shashina es shema vishina es mekoma. He says there's been a more dramatic change, a more drastic change in the Ola case, the Ola bird case, than in your than in your analogy. In your analogy, you did everything according to the protocol of an asham, uh, including where you slaughtered the animal. The only thing you changed it was in your mind, your intent. That's not enough to transform the animal into a shlomim. But over here you have transformed the animal because not only did you change your intents to turn it into a chatos, but you've also changed the blood placement as well. And therefore, since you did the blood placement like a chatos, you had the intention of a chatos, it becomes a chatos. So, Amr lo Rebbe Eliezer, Ashem sheshachto bedarim l'shem shlamim yochiach, sheshina eshmo v'shina smakom mo'alinbo. So, Rebbe Eliezer says, okay, fine. If you want to get that technical, I'll change the analogy. And I'll say, okay, an asham that you didn't slaughter in the north. You did the protocol in the south, let's say. So therefore you treated it like a shlamim in your protocol, not only in your intent. But still, the meat of that animal before you do the zrika saddam is going to be subject to me'ila. So how can you say just because you treated it like a shlamim, it's now transformed into a shlamim? It's not. It's still subject to me'ila. So afata al tismal haola shafal pishashina eshema vishina esmekayma malalimba, and therefore you should say the same thing. Something that's been pre-designated as an ola can never change its status. So Amar le Rabbi Yehoshua lo imamarta baashem shashina eshemo vishina esmekamo veloshina esmasav 
Tomar ba'ola sheshina eshema ve'esma aseha ve'shina esma koima. So Rabbi Yeshua says, no, it's still not a, a fair analogy. He says, because when it comes to animal sacrifice, this is only one way to slaughter an animal. You use a knife and you sever both simonim, the trachea and the esophagus. <coughs> so at least that you've shared in common. So the way that you've killed the animal is the same way as if you killed an asham. So you haven't completely taken it, at, taken it out of the realm of an asham to transform it into a shlamim. But over here, you've completely taken the animal out of the realm of an ola, because you only severed one simon, and you did the blood work below instead of above, and you thought about it as a chatas. So you've got so many drastic and dramatic changes from its original that it becomes, it turns into a chatas and therefore not subject to me'ila. So Amar Rava v'neimolei asham sheshachdu b'darum l'shem shlamim b'shinei ba'olam sheshina eshemo b'shina esmakamo b'shina esmasav. So Rava says, why, so I mean this is really the end of the b'risa and now Rava comments on the b'risa. He says, why didn't Rebbe Eliezer continue the argument and state as follows? He says, okay, let's say an analogy of an asham where not only do you change where you slaughtered it, but you also, and you intended it for it to be a shlomim, but you also intended it for a different person for, from, from the person who brought it. And the argument that Rav is trying to suggest is changing the person is just as dramatic as changing the form of killing the animal. In other words, it's another type of dramatic change, and yet you still say, you still see that the animal retains its asham status and is subject to me'ilah. But midaloka amar lehachi shmami na nachis Rabbi Eliezer letaimi de Rabbi Yoshua. The fact that Rabbi Eliezer did not continue in the brice of this line of argumentation is because he finally got it. He finally chapped what Rabbi Yoshua was trying to communicate, and that is the amar of Ada bar Ahava, Omer haya Rabbi Yoshua ola saof sha asalamata kemase chatas l'shem chatas kaven shemolak ba siman echad nimsheches venase chatas saof. And Rav Adabar Abba really spells it out, what we've been intimating all along, is that when you take an Ola bird, but you do everything to it in the form of a chatas, so you've taken it completely out of the realm in both thought and deed from an Ola bird, it really does transform into a chatas bird. It transforms into a chatas bird. And that's why once you finish all of the avoda, it's no longer subject to me'ila because the flesh can be eaten by kohanim. So I just want to point out that we're going to state this more carefully in just a moment. So just bear with me as we refine this idea more and more. So the Gemara says, mm-hmm. So the Gemara's question is, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. All right? What's good for one bird is good for another bird. What's, what's good, if, if you're going to tell me, that when you pre-designate a bird as an oila, but you completely treat it in a change of action and a change of thought as a chatas, why don't you say the same thing when you designate a bird as a chatas and you completely change its protocol? So you do malika instead of with one sim and you do malika with two simon. You think about it as an ola and you do the blood work above the chut instead of below the chut. Are you going to suggest to me that there too you've completely transformed it into an ola and therefore it counts as an ola? And if you tell me that that's taka the halacha, but I got a problem with that because the statement that was made in the name of Rabbi Na'a is this is the presentation of the Mishnah. Now, what, is those, what do those words mean? This is the presentation of the Mishnah. My love, kachi hatsa What that in sounds like he's saying is is that this is the only time that there's a machlokas between Rabbi Yehoshua and Rabbi Eliezer, only when you take an ola, pre-designated ola bird and treat it like a chatas, but not vice versa. And why isn't it vice versa? Why can't you say, just like you say that an ola that's transformed is into a chatas is a chatas, so to a chatas that's transformed into an ola is an ola. So, lo, kach hatsa'a shal kula mishnah. No, perhaps what the words, this is the presentation of the Mishnah means, that this is an example of the general rule that applies to the converse as well. Maybe that's what he meant to say. So you have no raya from that statement. So at this point, the Gemara is entertaining the possibility that you can, it applies both from an ola to a chatas and from a chatas to an ola. But Ravashi Omar, no. Ravashi says, no, it's only unilateral. It's only when you take a pre-designated ola bird 
you can transform it into a chatas. But it doesn't work vice versa. Why not? Bishlama ola sa'ov sha'asa lamata kemase chatas l'shem chatas keven daha hechshira b'simon echad v'ha hechshira b'shnei simonim v'ola sa'ov lamata lesa keven demolak b'simon echad nimsheches v'nase chatas ha'ov. Okay. So, but I'm going to continue reading so just to get the full flavor. Ela chatas ha'ov keven damar mar malika b'chol makom kishera Period. Let me just explain what's going on over here. The way that Rashi point, explains the logic is like this. In order for an Ola bird to be successfully transformed to a Chattas bird, you have to change every feature of the Avoda and the intent such that at no point is anything that you're doing imitative of an Ola. It has to be completely outside the realm of an ola in, in deed and in thought. And once that's done, it transforms completely to a chatas. So think about it for a second. You're thinking about a chatas. You're doing the blood work on below the chut like a chatas. And as soon as you sever the first simen, you've accomplished changing it from, you, you've done the work of a chatas on it, before you even sever the second simon, which would be imitative of Enola. In other words, the point being is that severing just the first simon accomplishes taking it out of the realm of an Ola, because an Ola requires the severing of two simon. So just the severing of one simon, you've already demonstrated a taking out of the realm of an Ola, not, be, not in any way doing anything that's similar to an Ola. But try to reverse that. Now let's talk about a pre-designated chattas bird. And you want to now change it into the realm of an ola. And you have to do it in such a way that at no stage of the game are you imitating a chattas and it's completely changed into an ola in protocol. You can't do that. Because in order to get to sever two simonim, you first have to sever one. So once you've severed the first simon, you've already done something that is imitative of a chattas, and therefore you've ruined it. Because once you've connected it to a chattas indeed, you can no longer transform it into an ola. So that's the logic that Ravashi presents why it doesn't work vice versa. You're sort of locked in. You're locked, locked in. in when you do that. Once you've severed the so first simon, you've now done something that is in the realm of a chattas, and therefore it's no longer transformable into an ola. But an ola can be transformed into a chattas because by severing the first simon, You've accomplished the deed of a chattas, and as long as that's done, you can say, I'm not in any way doing anything that's imitative of an ola. Okay. Gufa. Omer Rav Ada bar Ahava, Omer Haya Rabbi Yeshua, Ola Sa'op Sha Solomata Kamase Chattas Lashem Chattas, Kevin Shemolak Basiman Echad, Nimsheches Venases Chattas Ao. So let's go back to that statement of Rav Ada bar Ahava. He is essentially arguing that according to Rabbi Yehoshua, if I take a pre designated ola bird, and I do everything in thought and deed as a chattas, it actually is transformed into a korban chattas. Now we're going to challenge that with a couple of mishnayas. So Tashma, chattas lezu va'ola lezu. Now, we're going to be quoting over the next piece of Gemara some mishnayas from Maseches Kinim. Now, as soon as you hear that we're quoting from Maseches Kinim, your body should be filled with trepidation and shuddering. <laughs> Because Maseches Kinem is so complicated, it's so, almost Chazal's way of teaching us complex mathematics. Yeah, so, one? Per, different permutations. So we're going to try and simplify this as much as possible, and we're actually going to gloss over some of the portions that are not really germane to our discussion today. So, Chatos Lezu Va'ola Lezu. So the first case of the Mishnah Maseches Kinem is, you have two women, Rachel and Leah. Both of them have given birth, Mazel Tov. Rachel has to bring, as when after you give birth, you have an obligation to bring two birds, one for a chattas and one for an ola. Now, what happens is in this situation, as Rachel has already brought her one bird as a chattas and hasn't yet brought an ola. Leah, just the opposite. She brought her ola bird, but not the chattas. So they meet each other on the Temple Mount and they say, hey, we each have a bird that we have to bring. You got to bring a chattas, I got to bring an ola. Let's buy a pair of birds together and bring them to the Kohen together and we'll let him take care of it. So, of course, the Kohen, when he does the avoda, 
is not clear on whose bird is whose, and therefore is not clear on which one is the chatas and which one is the ola. So therefore, chatas lezu ola lezu, asa shtein lamayla, mechza kashru, mechza pasu. If the Kohen does both birds, both the blood work of both birds he does above the chut, then the one for an ola was yotze, and the one for the chatas was not yotze. Shtei in lamata, mechza kashru, mechza pasu. If he does the blood work of both birds below the chutz, so the one who needed to bring the chatas was yotze, the one who needed to bring the ola is not yotze. Echas lamayla ve'echas lamata, shtei in psulo shani omer chatas kareva lamayla ve'ola kareva lamata. But if the Kohen decides he'll be a chacham and he'll bring one bird above the chut and one bird below the chut, then both birds are puzzle. Because on the one hand, maybe he guessed correctly and he put the, chat, the ola bird above and the chatas bird below. But what if he botched it? What if he messed it up? And he ended up putting the chatas blood on top and the ola blood below. In that situation, he did neither correctly and therefore they have to replace both birds. So the, that's the end of the Mishnah. So the Gemara now says... Now, even if the coin messed it up and he ended up doing the ola bird below the chut, let at least the woman who had to bring the chatas be yotze. Because, I mean, after all, okay, he botched the chatas bird, but even if he, got the, if he botched the ola bird, according to Rabbi Yoshua, an ola bird which whole, whose whole protocol is done below the chut, can be transformed into a chatas bird. So why can't this bird be ola, be yotze, for the woman who needed to bring the chatas? That's the question. So the Gemara says, Amar de Amar Rebbe Yoshua b'chad gavr, betray gavri mi Omar. So the answer is, because maybe Rebbe Yoshua, when he says that you can transform an ola bird into a chatas bird, that's all well and good. But there's another chisaran over here, there's another problem over here, and that problem is that if the Kohen was bringing it for one person, it was pre-designated as an Ola for Leah. How can it now be Yotze for Rachel's Chatas? Right? That's the problem over here. It's the wrong party. Granted, it could be transformed into a Chatas, but it can be transformed into a Chatas for the person who brought it. Right? But it can't be transformed into a Chatas for a different person. That's the reason why it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Now, Tashma, let's look at another Mishnah in Maseches Kinim. Chatas Ola Ustuma Umefureshes. Okay, you got, again, two women who meet up with each other, and they're bringing three pairs of birds. Now, why are they bringing three pairs of birds? So each one of them had, to, had a child, and they have to bring, each one has to bring two birds, one for a chatas and one for an ola. And in addition, Rachel needed to bring a chatas separately, and Leah had to bring an ola. So it turns out... For some other reason. For, for some other reason. So Rachel is going to end up bringing two chatases and one ola, and Leah is going to end up bringing two olas and one chatas. Okay? So they purchase the birds, and for some obscure reason, they end up designating two individual birds as, okay, this is Rachel's chatas and this is Leah's ola. And then they do a stuma. Then they take another pair of birds and they say, we're going to let Stop. the... We'll let the Kohen decide which one is which. Okay? And then they take a, th- they take a third pair of birds and they say, Mifureshes, which means this one is a Chatas and which one, this one is an Ola, but we're not deciding whether it's Rachel's or Leah's. Okay? Each one's bringing three pairs? No. Both of them jointly bring three pairs oh, of birds. So there are six birds in total. Oh, so six birds total. Right. Okay? So, Gershon, don't get too worked up over this, okay? <laughs> so, Asa Kulan Lamala. No, I appreciate your, your, uh, your um, commitment zeal, to this, zeal. but your zeal, right? <laughs> so, Asa Kulan Lamala. So, if you, put, if you do all six birds, <laughs> so remember, three of these birds are supposed to be chatases, and three of these birds are supposed to be olas. But asa kulan lamayla, so therefore if you do all six birds above the chut, mechza kosher umechza pasal. Half the birds will be kosher because they were olas done correctly, and half will be pasal because three of them are chatases and you can't do a chatas above the chut. Kulan lamata, mechza kosher umechza pasal. If you do all six birds below the chut, so then half of them will be kosher chatases and the other half will not be kosher. So chetzin lamayla v'chetzin lamata, if you do half, the coin just arbitrarily takes three out of the six and does them above the chut, 
and the other three he does below the chut, just guessing which one is which. So, Eina Kesheira Elastuma, Umischalakas Beinehem. So the only birds that were kosher were the, the two birds that the, were never designated in advance, which means that the, the, the one pair of the birds we mentioned was called stuma, which means they basically said, we'll let the Kohen decide on the fly. In real time, when he does the avoda, when he does the avoda, whichever one he does above the chut, that'll be the ola, and whichever one he does below the chut will be the chata. So the only, those are the only two birds which we know for sure the Kohen got right. All of the other ones, maybe he mixed them all up and he botched the, all the, the other four. The ilu mifurash and lo. But the ones that were pre-designated, one for chatas and one for ola, those will not be yotze at all. But again, the same question, v'amai nihinami da'ola krei lamata timshach v'tihavi chatas ha'of. And here, the, the two birds that were, one was chatas, one was ola, and the, the ownership was not pre-designated, why can't you say that the bird that was done below the chut, even if he got it wrong and took the Ola bird and did it below the chut, why don't you say, like Rabbi Yeshua says, you can completely transform, as long as you do the protocol like a chatas, you can transform an Ola into a chatas. So why doesn't it, why at least not the one, uh, the, the one that was done below the chut from the Mifureshes pair, the one that was de- pre-designated as chatas and Ola, why don't you say that at least the one that was done below the chut counts as a chatas? And maybe you'll tell me that this Mishnah in Maseches Kinim does not go like Rebbe Yehoshua. How could you say such a thing based on the following Toshma, based on the following Mishnah? Now, before we see this Mishnah, I'm going to do something very unconventional. And I'm going to jump ahead a few lines to show you why we're, going, why we're invoking this Mishnah in the first place. It's very complex. And the whole purpose of invoking this Mishnah is to demonstrate that all of the Mishnayas in Maseches Kinim go according to Rebbe Yoshua. Now, where do we see this? This Mishnah is going to present to us, again, a series of permutations where a woman has to bring a certain number of birds. And because something got mixed up, she'll end up, instead of having to bring her initial set of birds, she'll have to bring another seven birds. Okay? Now... At the end of that whole statement of her having to bring seven birds, we're going to jump now to page Samachas Samad Aleph, seven lines down. On that, Omer Rebbe Yehoshua, Zehu Sha'omru, Keshuhu Chai Kolo Echad, Uchashu Meis Kolo Zayin. Rebbe Yehoshua, commenting on that halacha, states there's a metaphor that people say to reflect upon this phenomenon that sometimes when she was only supposed to bring one bird, she ends up having to bring seven that when an animal is alive, it can only make one sound. But when an animal is dead, it can make seven sounds. Because why? Because when you dismember the body, you take the horns and you make two chauffeurs out of it. And you can take the bones and make flutes out of it. And you can take the sinews and make guitars or harps out of it. So you can get so many different kinds of instrumentation, right, Rib David, all of the different... Yeah, strings. Yeah, strings, right? All of the different instruments you can get from an animal's body. You can get seven instruments out of one body, which when it's alive makes one voice. It's, so it's the analogy is, she was supposed to bring one bird, and she ends up bringing seven birds instead. So what do you see from here? You see from here that Rabbi Yeshua subscribes to all of the Mishnayas in Kinim. And if so, we're back to our original question. If according to Rabbi Yeshua, an Ola can be completely transformed into a legitimate Chatas, then why don't you say in Kinim, that even if the Kohen accidentally took the Ola bird and made, did it under the Chut, it's transformed into a Chatas and is kosher. So the Gemara's answer is, Amar da'amar Rebbe Yehoshua la'afuka midei mi'ila, lemesek le l'choiva mi'omar. Because I'll argue that when Rebbe Yehoshua says that you can transform an Ola into a Chatas, it's not that you can fulfill your obligation if you had to bring a Chatas with that bird, but rather, all he means is that it transforms into a chatas vis-a-vis, not being subject to the prohibition of mi'ila. That if I go ahead and eat that bird after the avoda is done, I'm not going to be liable for committing the avera of mi'ila, of violating something that was meant for the mizbeach. That's all he means. But he's not suggesting that your yotze, your obligation to bring a chatas with this, ola, this pre-designated ola bird. And that's the conclusion of the Gemara. Position, no, it's it's only bidiyavad. Yeah, it's so only bidiyavad. So really it's not. Be eating it anyway. 
So it's only eliminating yeah. from, from right. the but not that you, not that it's it's, it's not giving you a heter to eat it. Correct. Correct. Okay. So now that you've got the flow of the Gemara, now let's <laughs> fill in the, the part that's a little bit complicated, and we're just going to read it through, not so that we'll fully understand it, but that at least we can say we did the whole daf. Here's the Mishnah that demonstrates that this is the preamble to the statement of Rabbi Yoshua that sometimes an animal, which is one sound, can be transformed to seven sounds. So what's the, what's the Mishnah? Ha'isha sha'amra, harei alai kain im eileid zachar. Yolda Zacher Mevia Shtei Kinim Echas Lenidra Veechas Lechavasa. It starts off with the basic premise as follows. A woman takes a voluntary pledge that she didn't have to make, and she says, If I give birth to a male, I will bring a pair of birds as thanksgiving to the Lord. Now, what is the status of those two birds? They're both what's called an Olas Nedava. They are voluntary offerings that are meant to be to- that are me- that are two Olas. Okay? Now, if Shitaka gives birth to a male, the Bible places an obligation upon her to bring a pair of birds for childbirth. So therefore, she has to bring two pairs of birds. One, because of her voluntary pledge, those are two Ola birds. And then she's got to bring another pair of birds, which is one is Chattas and one is Ola, as the Torah prescribes, that after childbirth, you bring one Chattas and one Ola. So she's got to bring four birds. Three of them have to be Olas, and one of them has to be a Chattas. You with me so far? Very simple, very straightforward. Okay? So now... So very simply put, she presents the four birds to the Kohen. The Kohen now has to take three out of those four and, and treat them as olas and do, them, do the blood work above the chut. And for the chatas, he does the blood work below the chut. Now, lo asa kein, ela asa shtaim lamay lo shtaim lamata, velo nimlach. Let's say the Kohen did not consult with her and he thought that she was bringing, let's say, two pairs of birds for, for two childbirths instead of what she was really bringing it for, which was for one childbirth, but accompanied with a pair of voluntary Ola offerings. So what he does is that he brings two birds and does the blood work above the chut, and he, the other two birds he does below the, below the chut. So, Tzricha Shetavi od preda echas v'takrivena l'mayla mimin echad. So what she has to do now is she has to bring a replacement bird for that one bird that was done below when it should have been done above for the Ola. Now, umishnei minim, but that's only if all the birds were of the same species. But let's say she, when she set aside her pairs of birds, they were two different species. If she had set aside a pair of birds for her, for her nadava as pigeons, and the Kohen brought the other bird as doves, and she doesn't remember whether she pledged pigeons or doves, so she's got to bring now two birds just to hedge her bets, because she doesn't remember whether the ola that she was supposed to bring was a pigeon, the one that wasn't brought, was it a pigeon or a dove? She doesn't know. She doesn't know whether the one that wasn't done correctly was a pigeon or a dove, and therefore she's got to bring two birds, one pigeon and one dove. Now, Pirsha Nidra, let's say she specified her neder. Now what that means is, when she, we say that she specified her neder, she said, Kishin, like Rashi says, Kishinadra harei alai kein pirshas hamin shetavi. She specified whether she was going to bring a pair of pigeons or a pair of doves. And she doesn't remember whether she promised to bring doves or pigeons. And the Kohen botched it and did two above and two below, instead of three above and three below. So tzricha lahavi od gimel preidim mimin echad, so if all of the birds that were brought originally were of the same species, but we don't remember whether they were all pigeons or all doves, she has to bring three replacement birds. But if the two pairs of birds that were originally brought were of two different species, and we don't remember which one was which, so then she has to bring a total of four birds. Kavanidra. Now let's say she goes even further and she says that if I have a male child, not only will I bring an additional pair of birds as an ola, but I will bring them concomitantly with the obligatory birds. So what the, she's essentially saying is that the only way that I will fulfill my pledge is if I bring it at the same time that I bring my childbirth birds, the chatas and the ola. So now the coin has botched it, so she has to really repeat the whole process again because the chatas and the ola were brought previously. She's got to now bring new birds and replace everything. So Tzricha Lahavi Od Gimel, so Pirshanidra, 
oh, sorry, Kava Nidra, Tzricha Shetavi Ot Chamesh Preiden Lamay, Lami Min Echad, Umi Beis Minim Tavi Sheish. So then she's going to have to bring an additional five birds if all of the birds were of the same species, meaning they were all pigeons or all doves. And if they were a combination of pigeons and doves, she's going to have to bring an additional six birds. Nasna and Lakoin Veina Yodas Ma Nasna. If she gave them all to a coin originally, and she the four birds, and she doesn't know what she gave, so then the, she's going to have to bring another four for her neder, and two for her obligatory plus uh, olas plus one chatas, and Ben Aze Omer Beis chatos, and Ben Aze says she'll have to bring two chataos for a total of eight birds that are replacement birds, because Ben Aze is of the opinion that whatever bird was brought as an ola in the pair has to be the same species as the chatas in the pair. Bottom line is, if you want to go to the, through the permutations, you have every right to do so on your own time, but I'm not going to keep you here to go through all of the math and all of the permutations. But the bottom line is, is that, uh, at least according to the Tanakama, you could bring a total of additional seven birds when you were originally only supposed to bring four birds in order to be able to make up all of the mess-ups that were done by both the woman and the Kohen. And that's where we got, that was the fill-in. But the point is, at the end of the day, the f- conclusion of the Gemara, which is the important point that I want you to draw out of this, is that according to Rabbi Yehoshua, when he says the Ola can be transformed into a Chatas, it's not that you can be Yotze, the Chatas, if you had to bring a Chatas with this, but rather that if you eat it, you're not in violation of Mi'ilah. Have a wonderful day. So,